Well, um, we're going to formally begin in a moment. I would like to uh, just have my uh, co-partner here uh, introduce himself in case uh, you folks don't know Terry. He's from, uh, well, he founded a new Republic of the Heart, um, a wonderful organization. There's a book by the same name. I read every word on every page. It's excellent. And um, yeah, just a warm welcome to you, Terry. And maybe you can kind of launch us off before I go into the, into the science piece. Well, this moment in the human journey is deeply, deeply paradoxical because we all thought for hundreds and hundreds of years that we were on a path of progress and we've run into a place in which God caught up with us. And life is, is clearly teaching us something new, requiring us to become different. And that process of becoming different isn't just superficial, it isn't just the mind we already have makes note of a few new injunctions and we behave a little bit differently. It actually goes right to the heart of who we are and how we are. And because it's a collective life and death challenge, it's something we can only do together. So for us to gather in the disposition of practitioners and people who are growing and learning in order to become closer to reality, closer to our own experience, closer to one another, and a, a deeper depth of presence with some things that much of the time feel too horrible to fully face. So I'm excited to do this with my fr good friend, Jonathan, and take it away, Jonathan, thank you. I'm excited to do this with you too. All right. Well, I actually just want to begin by uh, suggesting we take a, a, a minute of silence and close your eyes if you wish. You can kind of turn down the volume from my speaking and just soak in the silence and stillness if that's your preference. And if you are tuning into uh, what I'm saying, I invite you to feel the field, the collective field of the 578 souls that are on this call and also into the future in YouTube land where many more people are listening in the now. And we are connected for better and for worse <laughs> in all ways. There's this diversity and multiplicity, and there's also unity. And allowing yourself to sink and dwell, abide in this feeling and experience of connection. Well, we're calling this um, climate change's spiritual practice from despair to empowerment. Um, in some ways, it's good to disambiguate these two terms, climate change over here, spiritual practice over here. And yet it's our contention um, that these are non-separate. They are ultimately undivided. 
what is it to experience climate change within as a modulation of an expression of our collective spiritual practice, which in some ways, frankly, is not going so well. <laughs> How can our spiritual practice inform and ground who we are and what we do at this pivotal moment in human and earth history? And how can we move from despair to empowerment, but not just in that linear way, because empowerment transcends, but it includes despair. It's not about running roughshod over despair, getting rid of it, uh, and just being empowered. Part of empowerment is the broken heart. And uh, if you're reading the news and you're open, uh, you, of course, know exactly what I mean. So, you know it, the just when I want it to work. Oh, all right. Well, there you go. Um, climate change is a potent koan. It's an inquiry, you know, really of <laughs> most unusual force and power uh, that can instigate a collective awakening. I can't think of any more Zen stick, more powerful coming down with more force than climate change. It's a make or break moment. And so I wanna start with um, the science, um, just seven minutes worth. Um, you all have heard most of this before. So I think seven minutes will suffice. Uh, but one of the big problems um, or contributing factors is carbon dioxide. And uh, just looking at this 50 lane traffic jam, 50 lane um, in China, uh, kind of will say what needs to be said about uh, what we as humans are contributing to the situation. Everyone has seen this graph. We know that carbon dioxide helps hold in the heat of the atmosphere. And as carbon dioxide levels increase, so does global temperatures. And again, if everybody could just keep yourself, just check to make sure you're, you're muted, that would be a, a really big help. Already, this is really important to recognize, it's, it's well underway. We have a 1.8 degree Fahrenheit increase in global temperatures since the 1800s, since we started burning fossil fuels. So this is something that's active. It's current. It's happening now. By mid-century, we're looking at a four to six or more degree increase in global temperatures. And by the end of the century, 14 or more degrees. So I would say we've received the worst news in our entire human history. Uh, and what's, what's even more galling and rankling is uh, we're the cause. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPIC, forecasts a temperature rise of two and a half to 10 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century, causing catastrophic effects. For some reason, I can't say catastrophic today. Um, and there's reason to believe that this is lo being lowballed here. Um, some people think that the numbers have been fudged by IPIC, uh, or at the very least, uh, you know, underrepresented. So if this is the best case scenario, it's not too good. And if this is off, as I and others believe, then it's even worse than uh, it seems when you look at this chart. Um, it's true that uh, carbon concentrations have gone up and down uh, throughout the millennia. But they've always, at least for the last 400,000 years, been between 175 and 300 parts per million, back and forth. Well, look at the right-hand part of the graph. It has soared past 400 parts per million in recent times. So we are living in unusual and unprecedented times. So we face a possible imminent and abrupt climate change leading to rapid extinction of most or all species. I'll just let that hang for a moment. 
And yes, you know, the earth has experienced abrupt climate change before uh, 12,000 years ago. Uh, within just a few years, Greenland saw an 18 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature. So this is something that can and has happened on the earth. But that was just Greenland. It wasn't the entire globe. Um, of course, it's not just carbon, although carbon <laughs> makes everything worse. This blanket of carbon in the atmosphere has triggered runaway warming from the release of methane gases that have been trapped for eons under Arctic ice. So methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon. In its first 20 years after it's released, it's 86 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And whereas the full effect of heat from a carbon dioxide molecule takes 10 years, peak warming from a, uh, uh, a molecule of methane occurs in a matter of just months. This is a picture of a, a methane sinkhole in the so-called permafrost, uh, not well named because it's not permanent frost. This is in Canada. Um, and there is a concern of something called uh, a methane burp where billions, billions of tons of methane is released if and when we experience a full summer Arctic ice melting. And scientists are saying that we're looking at about mm, five years until that happens. I, I just sort of want to repeat almost everything I say because it just seems like, oh, he's just saying a full summer Arctic ice melt, a full summer Arctic ice melt. That is, I'll keep using this word, catastrophic. Um, there are other gases. I'll only mention two more. Nitrous oxide is 300 times as powerful as CO2. It's emitted in our coal burning plants. Sulfur hexafluoride is 23,500 times as powerful as CO2. Just walk to your kitchen, look at your refrigerator and know that element, that gas is in your fridge. And it's not just the burning of and the release of these molecules. There are feedback loops. I'm only going to just describe one of them to you. This one is called the albedo effect. We know right now Greenland, uh, the ice and snow is melting at a precipitous rate. There's no doubt about this, none. <laughs> and as it melts, what's revealed is the bedrock, the dirt, and more and more ocean water. What happens is then the sunlight, instead of being reflected back out into space and the heat and radiation back out, because snow and ice is white, uh, instead the darker colors of the bedrock, the soil, and the ocean trap more heat. This is a vicious catch-22 situation. So humanity is careening towards the death of billions of people, millions of species, and the collapse of civilization. I'll, I'll just stop there because <laughs> what I just said, to take it in. I invite you from time to time, I think right now would be a good one, just to take a breath. There's something about being together as a group of 600 people, 607, and receiving this together. I have a way of doom scrolling on my phone and I just read, 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 you know, but let this be a kind of collective spiritual inquiry where we, each of us attempts to keep our hearts soft and open, even at the risk of it feeling injured. Again, if you could please make sure you're uh, muted, that would be great. What we're facing is a national security threat of unprecedented proportions, a public health, health threat of biblical proportions. Oop. And uh, the slide that just went by is a moral emergency as the very poor and minorities and the disenfranchised are the ones that will suffer the most during the first phase of climate change. And then it's all of us. This is a picture I got from the internet from Hurricane Katrina. 
as you well know, it was um, the BIPOC community, the disenfranchised, the poor, who uh, received by far the worst of it in Hurricane Katrina. And this pattern is going to continue, is continuing, and will deepen um, as climate change progresses. So here's my question. Why is our response underwhelming? Well, I think it's obvious, but I'll just say it, that were we to thaw, were we to make ourselves available to the truth of the situation, it would be very depressing and uh, overwhelming. And understandably, we would want to be in denial. Denial is a very primitive defense mechanism. And it's a good one because sometimes, frankly, we just need to actually bury our heads and take a break. Existing only in denial is not a good idea. It risks everything. On the other hand, I'm not suggesting that you spend 24 seven looking over the precipice either. That would not be skillful. So to end this little um, part of the presentation, I want to take us through five facts. I, uh, this is an edited and adoptive version uh, from Job One for Humanity, an amazing website that I recommend. Um, and uh, they regard these as facts, and uh, that's how I'll present them. Our governments have ignored more than 35 years of global warming warnings by our best climate scientists. Some of our administrations have ignored more than others. No administration in my memory has uh, come close to getting an A+. So a good deal of um, responsibility goes to our elected officials who have not done uh, particularly well by us. which is why it's so important that we hold them accountable, that one of the most powerful things that we can do is put pressure, that just continuous pressure on our uh, elected officials. Fact two, our governments have grossly underestimated how bad global warming is going to get and how soon global warming will exponentially worsen. There's five of these facts. I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes for a minute and just take one deep breath. Just feeling your ground, feet flat on the ground if you'd like. You can have your hands and your thighs and just feel you have a body. You're alive. You're alive. Fact three. We have now reached a global warming acceleration level where only a worldwide government-driven mass mobilization can save us from total extinction. It's nothing one or two or 10 or even a million of us does alone. Let that sink in. The acceleration has started. We need our government led by us, pressured by us to instigate a mass mobilization to save us from total extinction. Again, take another breath. I'm not educating you about things that you probably don't know. What is unique here is that we are receiving this together in warm heartedness. All right, two more to go. Only by getting close to the global 2025 fossil fuel reduction targets and successfully managing so many of the other non-global warming global crises will we give ourselves the needed time and resources to prevent the total extinction of humanity from occurring from 2070 to 2100. Let that sink in, breathing through it. If you feel angry or outraged or grief-stricken, 
or brokenhearted or frozen. It's all welcome here, every bit of it. All right, last piece. Depending on your current location, there's actually no need to panic at this moment. Please take that in too. You should still have enough time to prepare and adapt for the myriad now unavoidable global warming consequences. It's not a case of stopping global warming and its effects. It's slowing it, stopping it, uh, as much as we can and mitigating as much as we can the disastrous consequences, which is still incredibly important. Preserving any life is better than nothing. All right, last couple slides and then we're going to uh, come to another section here. I'm actually gonna ask Terry in a moment to just sort of weigh in on how he receives the, the news and these, uh, these things that I've been sharing here with you. I like this cartoon. It looks like the Titanic world leaders. It's settled. We agree to sign a pledge to hold another meeting to consider changing course at a date yet to be determined. Yeah, business as usual isn't going to cut it. I sometimes feel like I'm on the deck of the Titanic um, doing what I do, what I love, what I reveal, what, I, what has been revealed to me to be my soul level purpose to be a midwife of wholeness and to deliver that through the vehicles of meditation, teaching and psychotherapy and purpose guiding. But to do that on the deck of the Titanic feels, how shall I say, um, it creates a kind of a, what is this friction in my mind? So here's what I don't wanna to say to my son Yi, that's a picture of him. I don't want to say to him in the year 2030, eight and a half years from now, I tried not to think about what's happening during the pivotal decade in human history. It was just too overwhelming for me. Overwhelm is not our friend. Denial is not our friend. This is a picture from just yesterday. The third largest wildfire in California history is happening now. Uh, we all know what happened in Lytton, Canada last year. Lytton, Lytton Canada, 121 degree heat, and the town has uh, been wiped out. So I'm going to ask Terry to just uh, speak a little bit, um, uh, reflect on what was just shared, uh, begin to tee us up for the grief circle, and then I'll uh, share a few guidelines for the grief circle and a few words about it. Terry? Thanks, Jonathan. Um... So climate change is not a something that we can see at once. There's a philosopher named Timothy Morton who coined a new term called a hyper object. It means that there are some things that we have, may have names for, but they're so vast and complex that they exceed our perception. And there are some key principles that are hard to keep in focus at the same time. For instance, that this very moment is beautiful, that life and even the larger process of living and dying that contains the end of life is beautiful and sacred that any true spiritual practitioner is not fixated in the position of a separate embodied being who is threatened, but wakes up in the highest spiritual realizations to a free spaciousness that is bright and grateful and amazed and that is coinciding with the very mystery of existence that gave birth to this whole universe, to this beautiful blue planet, 
to these billions of years of biological and then cultural evolution. And that death isn't a problem. Death makes life possible. If all the people of the centuries past had not died, there wouldn't be room here for us and we are going to be passing ourselves. And that's okay. So there's something about being with the enormity that there's something that really matters, that needs urgent action, that we have a limited scope of power as individuals, somewhat greater power together, but not necessarily enough to address everything that's needed. And yet in our in being in integrity, hard integrity with future generations, we have to do all we can. We have to find our way to a real integrity. I don't wanna say to the generations to come, to my son or my grandchild, that I was so frozen by my horror and guilt that I scurried around in a sense of anxious, anxious anxiety and problem. And I brought those qualities to other people and I was a source of division, even though I knew some true things and therefore I didn't make things any better. And I don't want to say that I was so focused on trying to keep my own consciousness in a good place that I didn't take tangible action and make a difference in terms of the physics that are non-negotiable. And there are many, many other perspectives. We all know people who are doomers or preppers or utterly given over to direct action or who are profound spiritual practitioners and the source of love and light in the lives of many other people. And every single one of us is still in school, still learning. There isn't one of these responses or two or three or even all that are sufficient. Radical transformation of our very being radical transformation of our doing, radical transformation of our way of being present to ourselves and one another. All of that is called into the space. If there is any spiritual practice in this picture, it teaches us that life is a school. And right now, life is teaching billions of us a very integrated and similar lesson through this wild hyper object, climate change. Let's soften into contact with what we can see and what we can know and with what we can't see yet and can't know. So that we're more interested in what we don't know we're more interested in how we can help and brighten and be a source of health and beauty and truth than we are in hammering home our righteous certainties that haven't gotten us anywhere. And so as we do that, let's just sort of, yeah, breathe and breathe and get into contact with yourself and your own living and dying body and one another. And let's be curious. Something new can happen in this next moment. Life is infinitely creative. For all that we know, there is possibility. Let's be together in the light of that possibility related to what might be. Wonderfully surprising. So back to you, Jonathan. 
Thank you, Terry. Well, we're going to move right into what um, we're going to call a grief circle. And um, uh, first, I'm going to have a few people share and ask Terry to receive, reflect, mirror, hold, respond very briefly to a few. And then we're going to have breakout groups. Um, there will be uh, 50 breakout groups and there'll be, uh, Mason, there'll be 14 people each. 14 people each. So here's the seed question. What is in your heart right now regarding climate change? Just eyes closed, if you will. There is, of course, no right or wrong answer. as you let yourself fully face, be fully taken by the reality that we are facing and the near-term reality coming. And I, if you can please mute yourself. Yeah, thank you. How do you feel? What's the response? What does it feel like in your body? What's the emotional texture or perfume? And just be a field of spaciousness and welcoming to yourself. Give yourself this opportunity in this circle to know who you are and how you feel in response to climate change. So as I said, before we go into our breakout groups, I'll give a few little ground rules just before we do that. I wanna invite a few of you to raise your hand. You just go to reactions in the lower right-hand corner, hit the hand icon, I'll call on you. You can unmute yourself and let's start with Mark. Mark, please unmute yourself. Is this the right Mark? Yes, it is. <laughs> you wanted reflections for How Terry. do you? Yeah, well, no, not reflections for Terry, the, uh, your reflections on the question, what's in your heart as you contemplate the possible dieback or extinction of many species, including our own? What, what is your emotional, somatic response? In this moment, my response feels a bit ferocious, to be honest. Um, the intensity of what's going on and the grief that I've been through with it has is necessarily dragging me over the, the deepest wounds that I picked up on the way here. And I can feel that that tension in myself mounting. Like how do I hold that and be with it so I can continue to deepen my presence and my service. And I have a grief that, that's been overwhelming at times, you know, and um, challenging at times. And when I'm around other people that are willing to gaze full into what's happening, I'm, I'm mirrored what I need to bring that ferocity forward to keep going so I can hold the immensity of grief and the immensity of love. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The, uh, the way our emotional bodies are built, it tends to be that we really have to grow a lot in order to be able to hold positive and negative emotions and, and really experience them simultaneously so that we can be outraged and ferocious and brokenhearted and grateful and amazed and surrendered not 
in resistance to reality, but fully participating. That asks so much of us. And I hope I can be a friend to you as you, as all of us grow in our ability to be with this enormity that really asks for 360 degrees of, of feeling. Laura Matthews, please unmute and share what's in your heart. I'm, I'm particularly sad. It's so big. And I also have this glimmer of possibility because we are so amazing and so is life. And it some days feels like I'm being jerked back and forth between those. And some days there's a smoother transition. And some days it's all one experience. And to know that I'm here today with this many people who are sharing the brokenheartedness of this transition of all life is really, really important to me because my local community of family and friends aren't participating in this way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good to feel your present, vulnerable, passionate heart, Laura. Pam, Ver oh, were you going to say something or should I call the next person? Okay, Pam Vergen, please. What's in your heart? You can unmute yourself. Uh, so, um, uh, a mixture of um, feeling trapped and uh, grief and anger and trying to hold on to things like gratitude and um, find happiness and things like that and fatigue. Uh, I work with youth on the climate crisis I started this work about seven, eight years ago, uh, but for financial reasons, it's a long story, but I haven't been able to do it full time um, for the last few years or get it to a place where I can make a bigger difference sooner. I think I'm on the edge of this, but it's way too late. And ironically, it's been gotten in the way of by you, every major large nonprofit, except the one that got us here. Um, that I've contacted has sort of put stones in the way. But so I was glad, and I apologize for letting me, but I was glad to hear what you were saying because that's very much the same approach I use with the youth. And when I say youth, I mean fourth grade or so through- Working uh, with youth on climate. And so, yeah, um, it's called Youth Acting for Our Earth. And so trying to really kind of remind them that we can work together and we can uh, make things better than they will otherwise be, or at least we can do our very best to do that. Um, but it's very frustrating to be 
you know, I see my family struggling financially and pot with need for my time doing other things and trying to keep those things in balance. Um, I'm part of a Jewish congregation, which has helped a lot in terms of just keeping me centered. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the, you know, um, I knew about this stuff 40 years ago and I'm sorry, I missed the first part I missed, I'm going to guess is pretty much what I teach kids. And it's really, you know, we're working, I'm working with nine-year-olds who shouldn't even need to worry about stuff and they do. Um, the good thing is they have a way of making things fun. And we've brought in folks from many different backgrounds, which is not something I see in most gatherings, including this one. Um, but yeah, if you've ever seen these kids, I'm just going to try and get a proper screenshot of it for you. But uh, these two are mine, the only siblings. So this, these, these are the 21 youth who have been suing the federal government since 2015 to get action on climate change. So I really appreciated the Titanic picture. But yeah, it's just. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'm just trying to start a nonprofit now, but you know, in between that and my day job, it's not an easy thing to pull off. And trying to hold on to my sanity. You know, um, I had been a pretty serious spiritual practitioner for my whole adult life and taught integral practice for maybe 15 years and then about six or seven years ago, I recognized the speed at which the climate and ecological and total civilizational systemic crisis was proceeding and completely switched everything over. I stopped doing my own business. I helped found a nonprofit. I have worked through that nonprofit and the communities that have come into being through it. And I've really done my very best to grow in my capacity to be fully, feelingly, spiritually, uh, and lovingly, effectively, intelligently present to this utter mind blowing, impossible koan that we're all confronted with. And a lot of good came from that work. But I was still carrying a little bit of a burden on my shoulders, like I, if I could only do more, maybe this could be turned around. I'm failing and things are wrong. This is a problem. And then about four months ago, I, I've always been very healthy, active, fit, person very much in the outdoors. So I was shocked to get a, a sudden, it was on my birthday too, the day I turned 70, I landed in the hospital with a, a stage four rare aggressive cancer that the doctors didn't seem to think there was going to be any way for, you know, for me to avoid being killed by. And so there was this confrontation with my personal mortality that suddenly, you know, coincided with this deep, long-standing, years-long, deep contemplation of our collective mortality. And it's not just mortality, it's also morbidity. It's a medical term, but you don't have to die to hurt. And there are a lot of things that scare us that, you know, pain and indignities and other kinds of awkward suffering are sometimes more bothersome to us even than the thought of our own death. And I, so I've been, what had been for me a principled caring way of being a world citizen, but which rode on various abstractions hyper objects like climate change is now like in my very cells. And I'm working with it in a very intimate way. Maybe some of you are in the same situation. I'm hardly the only person to have such a thing 
happen. Mortality, you know, death, it's part of life. But I realized some things. I realized that if I don't have much more time left, I don't want to waste any of it being in resistance to what is. I want to completely accept and trust this moment, this life. I want to recognize its divine nature. I want to enter into participation with as much of my capacity as generously and with as much kindness in ways that really benefit other beings, human beings and all the so much more than human beings on this planet or even potentially beyond, that I just wanna brighten everything that I touch. I may not be here long, but I do have a choice as to how I am with it. And there's something about us all being in an analogous situation that creates a potential for so much intimacy. We've all felt like we have a burden that we can't acquit, that there's a, something on our, hanging on us, pressing on us that's more than we can deal with. We've all been in that situation, maybe are in that situation, and we're all less alone we just utter our lived felt experience in one another's presence and be present to the fact that this whole evolutionary story has been miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. The odds seem to be against me, but you never know. Spontaneous remissions occur. It seems absolutely impossible for us to turn anything around and for the human civilization to avoid this mass mass extinction event, but we don't absolutely know everything. There, it was a miracle that this blue planet came into being, that life came into being, that culture came into being, that hydrogen and helium left alone long enough, eventually have written symphonies and built cathedrals. And, and we are that. All that did that, that's live right now, as me, as you. And we need each other to enact whatever it is that is our opportunity. And that's an intimacy. And so climate change is an opportunity as well as a responsibility. And we, if we stay curious and humble, and willing to learn, then we're making room for whatever miracles are potential. It feels important to bear witness to that. For your wisdom, um, the other part of my life, my day job where I'm trying to make sure my family has an income I think when I try to talk about this, and I think you probably most, if not all of us have experienced this, um, I think that a lot of people really don't, their way of dealing with it is look the other way. And I'm a, I'm a social psychologist, by the way, so I know all about things like cognitive dissonance and how no one wants to take responsibility for what's happening. It's just because it, it's very quick to go from there to, you know, we're bad people. Um, but what's hard to explain to them is that when I work this program that I have, we still can have fun. We, we have a lot of fun, I and the other adults and youth. Um, you know, I have a screenshot I saved from the last training we did, a video conference, where this middle schooler who was leading uh, youth and adults in this training um, wrote me like, thank you so much for help, letting me lead. This was so much fun. And what did we talk about? Oh, the need to take care of each other because you know um, all of us at any moment could be hit by um, climate catastrophe. <laughs> so you know, it's you talked about. This is one of the big teachings I pulled from Judaism. Also, is you can have two very different things and they can both be true. Um, yeah. You know, you can have fun and you can talk about things that make you wish to not wake up the next day. You know, so oh, it's still fun and we can be good to each other. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. you for that. Thank you, Pam, very much. Well, we're going to um, open up the breakout groups in just a moment. And so here's the invitation. 
please share feelings, not facts. Your 45 seconds, please don't do a little dissertation on methane or carbon dioxide or this or that. What are you feeling in your heart in regards to climate change and possible mass extinction? And please just listen with compassion. Um, if you feel like you want to say to someone something sweet and nice, don't. Just send it, just, just your energy, your love to them. Let each person have their experience without trying to console them. Um, we're holding each other's stories, the material and confidentiality. So if you share what someone said, don't say their name. Um, and um, uh, that's, that's it. That's the, the, the whole of the instructions on how to do this. Um, other than to say, we're going to go sh shortest hair to longest hair person. Don't spend too much time working that out. So there's just a total of 12 minutes, 12 minutes. So it's probably less than a minute for each person. So get right to the main point. So if I were going, I would say, I sometimes lose my mind with this. This week I've been studying and reading and I just lose it. And my wife says, how are you doing? And I say, I'm doing terrible. I'm absolutely depressed. And depression isn't my normal MO. And I'm scared and I'm terrified. And I don't want to starve to death. And I don't want my son to starve to death. And I feel a sense of empowerment, like a calling. Like it's my destiny to attempt to do something. Period. Maybe that's what I would say. But I just said it. Okay, so Mason, if you put people into breakout groups, we'll send a little message every so often to let you know how close we are to the end of the 12 minutes. Again, shortest haired person to longest haired person will come back. I'll ask Terry to receive a few more stories and then we'll move into another element um, of our gathering. But this grief circle is could not be more important. Couldn't be more important. Okay. Enjoy too. You can enjoy it. I like what uh, she just said. <laughs> All right, let's start. <clears throat> so there should be a little button and you can click it and it should bring you to your breakout group. I'll say one thing in the next group. Okay. Well, we are uh, back, so to speak. The, the breakout group uh, situation didn't work, but that's totally okay. So instead, um, we're going to just continue to share for that 10 or 12 minutes that we were going to. So um, I will call on the next person. And that is um, Gwen, Gwen Garcelon. Unmute yourself and um, what's in your heart regarding climate change? Um, <clears throat> you know, I think very similar to you um, that th there in any given day, wild swings between despair and frustration, a lot of frustration. Um, and then dropping back into a purposefulness and um, this, the work that I've been training myself to do for my whole career. Um, you know, and I think, I think getting used to that, like really welcoming that, like my spiritual teacher once said to me, life is not about, you know, a, a um, staying in this sort of sense of stasis and beauty and bliss. It's about continually getting kicked out of the saddle and just getting back in the saddle with more grace. And I feel like that's my biggest spiritual practice lately is to have a lot of compassion for myself and my very emotional nature and to accept that as a gift that I still can feel so deeply and stay in action. And that's, I think that's where I'm at.
Beautiful. Thank you. I'm going to just keep calling on people and um, Terry, if you, uh, you know, want to say uh, anything in response at any point, please go for it. We're going to go to Jay uh, Dubetta. You can unmute yourself. What's in your heart? Um, so when you asked the question, Justin, and you asked me to go inward at a somatic level, I was surprised because there was such a feeling of like power of like this energy, this expansive feeling of, it was just powerful. And yeah, and I think that, so I had like a big spiritual awakening in 2012 where I really felt connected to like the life force of the planet and was seeing everyone through my heart and really had that kind of like pro prof profound connection to the sacredness of life for the first time. Um, and I, I don't want to take too much time, but I ended up um, quitting a, a job working on a violent zombie game in the animation industry after I was like broken by my grief um, and my attachments and stuff. And I worked for Greenpeace for a year and I went to university and I studied climate change and it was so overwhelming to really learn about the ins and outs of what's happening and how it's happening that I, um, I got dissuaded. But recently uh, I've been feeling like, even though I've been like training to become a life coach, like it would almost be a cop out for me from my purpose to do something other than work towards helping the planet and, and society and all life to um, undergo what's coming down the pipe and, and not dedicate myself to that. Um, so yes, there's, I, I resonate a lot with people. Like there are times where I feel powerless and hopeless, but I've, learned that when I'm doing something, when I'm in action, when I'm working towards positive changes, then there's a feeling of empowerment. Then I, I shift from grief and despair and hopelessness into a more hopeful, beautiful state and world. Yes, thank you, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Th these these deep lessons are also multidimensional. They, they, at a certain point, I sort of feel like, oh, I can articulate the lesson I've just learned. And there's real truth in that. And then the lesson continues to reveal more. And the lesson I was able to articulate turns out to only be part of what it is I was learning and it goes even further. There's something of acceptance and something of absolutely raging against the dying of the light that are both absolutely true and that seemingly can't coexist. And here we are together feeling all of it. How how deep and intimate, how full of potential, what a uh, fertile ground for the miraculous to be fully present here in this living divine moment. All of us expressions of the very heart, of the mystery of existence, life wanting to keep living evolution wanting to keep evolving and life woven together with dying. Wow. Penny Greer, please unmute yourself. I'm just going to ask this uh, one more time. Please keep your share short and just the emotion, the feeling. 
I know we have so much to teach and share to each other, but I really want to go boom, 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 and have a whole lot of people be able to share. And again, you can go to reactions at the very bottom right, click, raise your hand. And so let's just have a whole lot of people share how they're feeling. If you want to share, please. Numb. Hope. I'm a geologist. Mm. I know what happened in other extinctions. Hope. Hope. Rebecca and then Dagmar. Hope. Not and then hope and despair and sadness. Good. Rebecca from Rochester and then Dagmar, please. I, I thought there might be several Rebeccas, so I was being careful. Um, what what I one of the things I experience is fear and it's not so much fear of death because as we've already talked about death is part of of the life cycle but it's it's the it, it's the conditions that will take place that could take place prior to extinction the 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 violence the the meanness um the 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 fact that so many people don't seem to care right now um, scares me and 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 I, I I can I can face a world where things are challenging and catastrophic and we're and we're trying to help each other and pitch in and do what we can um, I'm frightened at a world where we're trying to compete with each other and and don't care about each other warmly received dogmar then wendy anderson yeah okay i i feel the same fear that rebecca just mentioned of the total catastrophe social catastrophe that i won't be i won't be able to I won't be able to manage it myself, that I'll lose my ability, my desire to help others and be present for that. I, and that makes me angry because of, um, it makes me angry and I have, I feel I have so much to offer with my experience as a, as a farmer for seven years and stories that I tell with which are stories of hope from indigenous cultures. And so, and I'm frustrated because I feel like people aren't, people don't want to hear me at the moment. I don't know where the community is that would like to, that I can share this, this aspect of hope that I do have from the old stories, the teaching stories. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy. Julia Gentle Strength and Farhad. Wendy Anderson, Julia Gentle Strength and Farhad. Um, and hi. Terry, anytime. <laughs> hi, I'm uh, Wendy Anderson in Cincinnati. And um, I have been concerned about climate change for a long time, but I haven't been passionate about it. And I feel like I just. Um, awakened in a sense, just within the last couple of weeks to the gravity of the situation that we're in. And what I feel is um, a deep sadness. I feel compassion that I didn't know I could feel. I feel anger sometimes. I feel an urgency and I have to remind myself to be patient and that a lot of the work that we all need to do is out there in the world making big changes, but a lot of it is just being loving and compassionate in every moment with everyone that we meet and just sharing our light. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Hello, I'm Julia Gentle Strength and I do feel a deep cracking shuddering grief, even as I feel deep 
joy because I feel like this grief is held that I am part of some kind of larger organism that we are. And this gorgeous place that I get to be in right now is, um, is part of that. Even as I witness it being hurt by the unprecedented heat that's coming and creating fires in this beautiful part of the world and also hurting the rest of this gorgeous, intricate, diverse world. Um, in this belonging need, it's this belonging need, this, this us doing it together feeling where this kind of abundance that we have inherent in us has this feeling of opportunity now too, that this precipice can help us birth into this amazing thing that we have, this gift of this mercy of each of our gifts. So I'm feeling some great hope as well that, that we might make our potential flourish even more, even more along with the flourishing of nature that we do still presently have, that we may grasp that. I have deep love for you all. You feel like family. Thank you so much. Mm. Thank you, Julia. Gentle strength. Farhad? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Farhad. I am uh, a Middle Eastern expatriate uh, living in Canada. As I'm speaking to you, uh, things are going horribly wrong in my home country uh, because of the drought and uh, parts of it, uh, even though uh, the mainstream media are silent about it, people take streets to protest just for water and being shot by the government. And I uh, feel a lot of grief and anger. Although a part of me is continuously telling me that there is a level of optimism and hope in this. Uh, such sort of challenges can, can wake us up. It can destabilize our egos and we can see how we are all together in this and how it matters that what happens in other parts of the world and how it affects it all. And I just have this hope that you know, this um, devastating course uh, will help us wake up the greater reality. Beautifully put. We're just going to do a couple more, then I'm going to ask Terry to just reflect, mirror, hold what we've said, and, and we're going to move on to another piece. Um, Adrian Kernan, and then the last word will go to Catherine H. Adrian, if you yes. speak. Okay. okay. Yes, I, I feel a combination of total despair and enormous gratitude that um, I'm going to be 82 and I've had at least 82 years to enjoy this life. Um, so many young people won't have that. And whatever it's been, it's been up and down and in and out as everybody's life is. But I am so grateful that I had the opportunity to be here and live it. I don't know what to do to make this better. Um, I, do, I do all my personal habits as best I can, but I don't know, I don't know how to make this better. And I, I despair on that. So I live in despair and gratitude. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much, Adrian. Yes. Yeah, one more. And that is uh, Catherine H. Um. I'm feeling so much closeness and softness with this, with this world and this current situation and, and the future possibilities. And I feel just a deep um, trust and love 
like I'm so inspired by Terry's words today, his sharing, and I I feel that this right in this moment, just so much trust with being being close and being present and receiving everything that's happening and everything that's going to happen and and a, a love of that. Um, and a gratitude for that. So I'm just feeling very warm and soft and close with this present and this future. Thank you. Beautifully said. <clears throat> I, uh, for me, the process of reckoning with climate change has gone on for really ever since we've been talking about it publicly, you know, since the first Earth Day. But I, it all seemed important and urgent and I would want to do the political actions that would influence policy. I was rooting for the future but it seemed a little abstract and it wasn't gonna land for a long time. And over time, I have gone through a whole series of dark nights of the soul in which the speed, the runaway character, not just of global warming, but of ecocide and species extinction. There's so many different dimensions to this collapse of the life systems, collapse of the social systems and political systems, cultural breakdowns, our ability even to get along with one another. And yet this is a gift. Somehow existence wanted to articulate itself in all the beauties of this amazing world in all the amazing creativity that humans have ever brought forth, and it's wanting to bear witness to it under these extreme, extreme conditions of life and death and stress. And somehow we are the lucky ones, lucky, you know, the Chinese, Chinese curse to, to be born in interesting times, but this whole evolutionary process wanted to know itself most fully, and it is knowing itself more and more fully through our heart minds right now, through my heart mind, and through our resonance with one another, our curiosity to be with one another, to be generously, caringly connected amidst what seems perhaps unthinkable. And somehow in the midst of that, I think I, for, for me, this, these last four months, the first, um, it was a huge shock, of course, to get this diagnosis four months ago, but it's a very, very rare cancer. It took a lot, a lot of time for them to even, I actually only started uh, treatment last week because it was so rare and weird. They, they couldn't find an effective treatment at first. And I've, my symptoms have gotten worse and worse now. Sometimes I'm too tired to do the things I want to do. Sometimes it's as though I am experiencing myself diminishing and you know the indignities of not being able to bring all of the qualities that are that are me, the sass and the humor and the generosity and the playfulness, you know, and I have only partial, a very, you know, fraction of, of, of what I would want. And yet, you know, loss has always been a part of this human experience. Grief is a form of wisdom. And gratitude isn't contradicted by grief. And we will go through this. Some people will go through this in an awful, ugly, hateful, murderous, Mad Max way, probably. Some people will do something 
profoundly beautiful. And we will write our names in the book of life the best we can. And here we are tenderly intending to feel it all and to be with one another as we find our way to being the more conscious, caring, capable, effective, competent human beings that this wild, wild moment in the human journey is asking for. You know, there are a number of different dimensions to this. Partly, this is absolutely intensely personal. And just talking about it in generalities and abstractions doesn't capture it. It's also intensely interpersonal, something we are experiencing and getting down into a depth of contact with one another. That's super, super important. There's something about accepting our death. If it's my time, I want to go gladly into the next whatever. Not bitter, not frightened, not resisting. And yet, there's a blazing forth of the light as often and as long as we're able to. And there's a generosity in doing that, a brightening of every happening. And here we are, it's all mysterious. Nobody has all the answers. We're here in a great Japanese Zen riddle, koan. What is the sound of one hand clapping? What is the sound? of full-hearted, humble, generous, holy human beings finding one another in the midst of what seems too terrible to face and becoming something more beautiful and powerful. What is the sound of that? We are listening together, listening into something so profound. So I'm listening with you and I'm grateful that we're coming together with a sincere intention to listen deeply. Thank you, Jonathan, for inviting me to do this with you. My privilege and honor. I, I, we're not going to get to everything in the schedule, but there's so many people who raise their hand that we don't have time to listen to uh, individually. I want to invite all 508 of you, especially the ones who haven't put anything into the chat. What is one emotion, one emotion that you are experiencing as you are contemplating, feeling, meeting climate change, possible extinction? And uh, you can put it in the chat. And I invite everybody to participate, everybody. Let your voice be heard. I'm here, I'm just being quiet because this is a holy moment, listening to your chat. Mm. <laughs> My goodness. Please keep typing. I'm going to read a few of these out loud. 
some people will be watching their recording. Loss of potential that life holds. From Sue. Changing mind to tender mercy. Marilyn. Massive grief that erupts at any time, anywhere. Mm. Lawrence, stop. <laughs> Clara, responsibility. I feel all the emotions, sometimes all at once. Creativity, trust. I feel anger over neglect. Endless curiosity, horror at hubris, broken hearted, grief, sadness, overwhelm, numbness and overwhelm, unbelievable. Fear that the butterfly will not be able to emerge from the chrysalis, the planetary transformation will sink into darkness, never to become a planet of love. Heartbreak for my granddaughter and all children to come for all the beauty that will be lost. Just read a couple more and then we'll make a switch. Wondering where to go, what to do, where am I called? That's what we'll get to next. Grief and surrender, tenderness. <sighs> Sorrow, cessation, fundamental oneness with what is. Hmm. Fascination and frustration. Okay, I want to receive everyone and say every one of them out loud, but there's 500. I just want to say, um, you just bring me to tears. You're showing up and you're making your voice heard and we are rising up adequately. Well, we will see but we've put our backs into it, given our almost two hours on a Saturday morning. Is it enough? No, but it's, uh, it's something. And I, I, for one, just feel your beauty, <laughs> your goodness, your truth, your desperation. I share it with you and I'm with you. I wish as the convener of this circle, I had the answers, but uh, of course I do not. Well, um, I want to lead us into the next piece. It's a meditation. It's a guided meditation. And here's the basic question. Who or what am I called to be? And what am I called to do at this time? Who or what either way works? Who am I called to be? In what way? Am I called to be? And what am I called to do? So we're going to have to shorten it because we're just going to have to. So I invite you to close your eyes. And Terry, when I um, complete, feel free to continue the meditation, add to it, subtract to it as you see fit. I'll, I'll just say something to you to indicate. So. Don't move away from the grief, the frustration, the longing, the ache, whatever it is that you're feeling. That's a place of power. Grief is not an impediment. It's not a speed bump to run over. It's your heart, your tender heart. So the first answer to the question, who am I called to be, is answering itself right now. Make space. Be the space in which your tender heart can feel what it feels. And through the power of imagination, this unsurpassed organ of perception and of sensing, we drop this seed question, two of them. Who am I called to be?
this time of climate change and possible rapid, abrupt extinction. Who am I called to be? If that's sufficient, you can either literally or figuratively kind of turn down the knob of my voice. But if it helps, I invite you to connect with five organs of perception, starting with your skin, feeling the entirety of this organ. Now, including the heart, the emotional center. Soul often speaks through emotions. Who am I called to be? And now the belly or the gut region. Your belly may speak to you the answer in gut language. And now let yourself go beyond the skin, the gut, and feel the truth that everything around you, the room that you're in, and wild nature or urban nature, as the case may be, is coextensive with your very own being. And it is communicating its wish, its desire, its pointer to you, who it wants you to be at this time. And one more, wild imagination itself. On the screen of the mind, perhaps an image will arise that calls you, magnetizes you into its shape. Imagination is a way of sensing into the truth that's deep inside of you. It's not just fantasy. So we'll just sit for a minute in silence with this question, who am I called to be? You can just dwell and abide in that question. But the second question, if you wish, you can drop into the well of your being, repeating the process. What am I called to do? The 10,000 ways I can press my body, my life, my time, my precious resources and energy into this moment. How? What is my sacred dance? If it's on the deck of the Titanic, how do I dance? How do I move? How do I respond? What are you called to do with this one wild, precious moment amidst and in climate change? Let it appear to you. You needn't use the cognition faculty. 
You can do that later. Just see if something bubbles up. If nothing does, that's fine. But in this sacred circle, see if soul doesn't give you an image, a signal, a communication. What am I being asked? So we'll rest in silence and stillness. We'll just put forth the question one more time. In this giant tapestry of need, what corner, what thread am I called to today, tomorrow, this week, to do my part in meeting this climatic moment. And then Terry, whenever you feel ready, feel free to bring your voice in. May each of us be a force of blessing and intention, a prayer for every other one of us to find our way through the places of stuckness and confusion, instead arriving again and again in this living process. Oh, the living divine mystery of existence is radiant, beautiful, astonishing, so loving. Let us allow that blessing in. Please give us the strength and discernment that when we hear these questions, we let them be many questions. It seems like a question to the deciding mind, but maybe it's a question to the inquiring soul. And maybe it's a question that's answered by the whole confluence of our whole spectrum of relations. May we each be given the courage and the compassion and the humor and the strength that we may show up beautiful, that we may be generous healing presences in the midst of whatever is to come, that we not lose track of the fact that that matters so much, that we discover inspiration and gladness of heart, even though tomorrow we die, as it used to be said. Of course, everything that has ever lived has died. And this is a mega, mega death, a specter of it at least. And yet this is a, we don't know. So being in that I don't know with the vibrant best of ourselves, let us all pray to be given that strength and pray for it to be given to one another. Pray to be better friends to one another that we may each be strengthened by our conjunction. Please give us the strength to be a bit more grateful knowing that the gratitude we feel is just a fragment of what's appropriate. We are so profoundly lucky to have so much to bear.
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Please help us keep arriving truly here, truly now. in the utterly amazing, radiant, gorgeous, loving, blissful, generous, healing reality that coincides with everything dark and brutal and heartbreaking. I've spoken. I can't help but just smile deep in my heart hearing your passion and love, Brother Terry. Thank you. <laughs> um, Mason, could we put uh, everybody's hand down that has their hand raised? Because I'm going to ask for another round of sharing. And um, again, ask Terry to uh, interject as he sees fit in terms of mirroring and holding. Um, but uh, I'd like to do that sharing again so that uh, I like the way Terry put it, the depth of our contact with each other is in sharing and being heard. And how did he put it? The sound of our wholehearted humanity. So here we are. I love his words. <laughs> um, so uh, in the chat, you can share. And if you're willing to share out here in the group, yay, raise your hand. If you raised your hand before, that's fine. If you spoke before, that's fine. Let's stop. start with Rod in Idaho. So again, the question, right? Yeah, right. Who... Am I called to be? What am I called to do? Please, as pithy as possible, because we just have 11 minutes. Oh, Thank well. you. Um, I wrote it down here. I'm, I'm called to being love and open. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Michelle, then Paloma and Richard. You're, you're Michelle, mu you're muted. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Yes. Um, what I'm called to be is with a very loving, conscious, balanced, sophisticated group of people where we find in a balanced way because of all we're tending in our life, how to be stewards together. I don't know if it's just here in our backyards or globally, but it is what is most true in my soul. Thank you. Paloma Richard, then Bo Smith. I'm called from subjective, ineffective rage against. I am called to membership, subjective membership within a fully competent Gaia, hmm. knowing that the Enzo, the wheel of life, has an opening for possibilities. Oof. Woman. Whoa, bear. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, beautiful. So, um, Paloma here, and I feel called to a kind of. Um, sort of eco chaplaincy is sort of a holding of earth and being held in earth um and uh and to do that in in curiosity in um outrageous sort of imagination and courage and uh and and heart with with this bear beside me and with with this group, but also asking who isn't here that um, who's not at this table that that we need to reach to and be held by. Thank you. Thank you. Bo then Shayla.
Oh, we can't hear you. Sorry about that. Great. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm called to just, you know, try to stay present in this and, and to be with people and myself and empathize with myself and others and, and practice compassion and, and forgiving myself for not understanding and, and how we're not understanding collectively. And, and, and sort of hold this anger and frustration and sense of despair, not holding it in, but holding it in a space where we can appreciate it and holding it in a space where we can at least continue to approach it and the only way I feel really called to do that because I don't really feel I have technical kind of skills because I'm in the space of not knowing what to do. This thing, and that's where this forgiveness of, of not understanding comes in and, and, and practice that, spread that. And lastly, and maybe most importantly, you know, really on a very personal level, just look people in the eyes and really try to understand and listen with compassion. Mm -hmm. Oh, Amen. Oh, Amen. And please, just because I want so many people to go, just the most important thing, one thing. Okay. Uh, Shayla, then Elaine. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Terry, and everyone. I'm being called right now to listen with Gaia and to Gaia in a way that I've never known how to do before so that I can work with her rather than impose my ideas on her. And I'm speaking about this with everyone who wants to, including young people on the street, like just keeping this conversation alive in every way I can. Mm. Oh, Amen. Elaine, then Stan. Yes, I'm called to be a, a loving, compassionate, and courageous midwife, community midwife, uh, revealing the potentials that have not yet been revealed. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Beautiful. Mm. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, I believe it was Stan, and then Heart Pillow. Yeah, thanks. So glad to be here in this wonderful community. To thank you, Terry, and your friends for creating this opportunity. I'm called to remind people to keep their eye on the prize. You know, of course, the situation is dire, but we don't help it by dwelling in negative emotions. So focus on what you want and not what you don't want. We all know what we don't want. We're surrounded by all the, you know, signs of it. But keep that vision clearly of what you want, because that's, that's where we want to go. So if you keep your attention there, you know, that's where your energy will flow. That's really the gist. Thank you. Thank you. Heart pillow, then Claudia. I'm called to move out into the communities of which I am a part and together, collectively, in spirit, to go forth. Amen. Thank you. And Claudia, you have the last word. Hi, I'm called to be a beauty maker and a beauty awakener to help all of us reconnect with the possibility of seeing the absolute miracle that 
Terry speaks of the miracle of, of life, how wondrous life is on this planet. Mm. Yes. 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 Thanks. So uh, if, if you haven't already, we're just going to take two minutes to do this. You can go to chat. You can go where it says two. You go to everybody. Um, and you can type in and let your voice be heard. Uh, the, the answer to the question, the response to the question, um, who am I called to be and what am I called to do at this time of the great turning uh, and or the great collapsing? And perhaps they're the same. And I'll read a few of them out loud. But let's just take a moment. Whether we are to be warriors for the human spirit amidst some horrors and some recoveries and some miracles or amidst a great hospice project that exceeds our imagination, we're still called to be of service and it, that is itself beautiful. And the more I open to that, the more I'm fed and inspired by that. And the less I push you away because of what's too hard to bear, the more I let you in with me amidst what's both too hard to bear and too beautiful to fully Oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. Well, if you need to drop off, um, blessings to you. And if you can stay 10 more minutes, um, we're gonna go 10 more minutes. So um, I'm gonna give an abbreviated uh, version of a, a, a little 10 minute presentation into four minutes, um, just a bit of it. Um, because uh, the practical, how, what was that woman's name? She said, walk the mystical path with practical feet. Angeles Arian. I love that. I'll say it again. Walking the mystical path, the undivided path, the path of consciousness with practical feet. So um, just going to share a few um, pieces with you and organized into four baskets, if you will. So, of course, <clears throat> the, what we're understanding about climate change is rapidly changing, um, especially as things progress and the feedback loops uh, become more severe it is important to keep ourselves uh, educated about what's happening. Uh, one place, there's many places to go to. I'll recommend this one called Job One for Humanity, joboneforhumanity.org. It is a website with so much information um, and I recommend it. Um, there's a piece that I watched, a video, by Michael Dowd called Serenity Prayer for the 21st Century. Um, and I'll, I'll share it with you uh, when I email you all, but um, you can just go to YouTube. Um, it, it'll break your heart. I was hemorrhaging on the floor um, after I watched it, but it was excellent. So just a few ideas for educating yourself. Um, the second basket is systemic action around electing and lobbying, you know, putting a price on carbon is pivotal to addressing climate change. It is by no means the only thing, <laughs> um, but it is one of them. Um, so one thing we can do is affect our, um, our elections. Um, and one organization I'm part of is Swing Left. Um, and I'll, I'll let you find out what it is and uh, how it works. Um, but I want to highly recommend it. I've been to their meetings. Um, 
lobbying our current elected officials. There's many ways to do it, many groups through which you can be part of. Citizens Climate, climate Lobby is one of them, and I recommend it to you. Um, there are so many action groups out there, um, and they're ones where you can find your people, your niche, your niche. You know, if you're a, uh, an uber progressive, great. Find your people and work with them. If you're a center liberal, great. Find your people and work with them. If you are an ultra right wing Christian fundamentalist, great. Go to your church, work with your people. It doesn't matter to me which group you belong to. We are all pulling together. Um, it's not just about reducing carbon. Uh, it's also about protecting all remaining primary rainforests and other undamaged, pristine ecosystems. I believe I got that line from, um, I just forgot his name. <laughs> repair and regenerate damaged ecosystems worldwide. There are so many things. You can't do it all. You're not supposed to do it all. You just respond to one of the next things that is calling loudly for your attention. Um, third is you can look at the, your own life and what you're doing. You can make lifestyle changes. Um, you can look at this in the recording if you want. These are just ways to reduce your CO2 emissions. Um, it's a chart that just says what, what the actual effect is of having one less child versus a vegan diet versus using a reusable bag. You can make your own um, decisions based on that. So this is just a little piece on the effect of, uh, of cattle. And another graph um, around the uh, impact of the different foods that we eat in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So the first is educate yourself, be an educated citizen, take some kind of systemic action. Obviously your own integrity. Sometimes I think, oh my God, what I'm doing doesn't make any difference, but there's a kind of nobility and a kind of power I find that comes from making the less selfish choice. I don't always do it, I want to say, you know, right up front, or actually, I guess at the back, I have a car that burns gasoline. I sometimes fly in planes and therefore use uh, jet fuel. And uh, in the winter, you know, my heater is using uh, natural gas. And yet there are things that we can do. And the last one is to take good care of yourself for breakfast, lunch, dinner, get support. Um, I'm a meditation teacher, so I'm just going to plug it. Equanimity is important. You're not going to feel equanimous all the time. It's just not going to happen. But a baseline of equanimity, a way to center yourself, ground yourself. Maybe it'll be prayer for you. Discovering your purpose and place. You know, where do you belong and what is your gift at this time? If indeed the Titanic is sinking slowly, the real Titanic took, I think, four or five hours. Um, obviously, climate change is much longer than that. What are you called to? Which part of the boat? Which life raft? What's the thing that you are destined to do today and then tomorrow? We face an initiatory threshold called climate change. It's a threshold. I bring people on these sort of distilled versions of a vision quest. I call them a soul quest. And one of the guardians at the gate for everybody, whether you go out on the land or not, is climate change. It's right there. There's a hundred other issues. This isn't the only one, right? And it begs us to make a sacred inquiry. What is our purpose in place? Where are we to serve? <laughs> um, you can never get enough of what you don't need. This is apparently a real thing. It's a sandwich made of donuts and chicken. Um, so I show this for a little levity, but also just to simply point out that what we are searching for, what we're longing for, would I like a Tesla? Yes, I would. Would I like to drink better wine? Most certainly. Um, would I like one of these sandwiches? Uh, actually not. But point being, right, is what really is that place where our deepest 
longing, our deepest, our deepest joy and the world's hunger meets. That's a quote from Frederick Buechner that I say in, as often as possible. Find the place where your deep gladness and the world's hunger and ache meets. And these are some folks that um, I believe, uh, I suspect, um, have found their place and are doing the work. I've met some of them. Obviously, some of them I haven't. Um, so I think I will stop there. And um, I have a few closing things I'm going to say and then hand it to Terry. I do want to um, thank Terry. Um, he's not just brilliant. He's not just a heartfelt guy, but there's a kind of creative intelligence uh, at work in the fellow. Um, he's a dear friend of mine. Um, and uh, I want you to know that starting in mid-September, he'll be offering a, a special intimate three session, what he's calling a wisdom inquiry and exploration during which he'll share his deepest inquiries and recognitions as he practices at the edge of what for him is a life threatening, but he also wrote life brightening, which was really beautiful health challenge. So uh, preliminary, the working title is brightening every uh, darkness. He'll explore the profound coinciding of personal mortality and collective mortality. I wish he weren't in the place where he could do that from experience, but he is in the place where he can do that from experience and how a conscious relationship to living and dying through spiritual practice and service can transform our individual lives and be beneficial to the whole world. So I will be following up uh, in an email a um, few days or a week about that um, to all of you. In the meantime, if you want to get on his email list or listen to his podcasts, New Republic of the heart.org new republic of the heart dot um, or terrypatton.com um, what else to tell you i will also be following up with an invitation um, to you to come to something i call introduction to purpose discovery so if that inquiry that koan how do I find the place where my deep gladness and the world's hunger meets? You may be interested to come to uh, that event, um, which will be happening in a couple of weeks. So I will follow up probably an email a week, about three or four of them. Um, you can unsubscribe if you're, you feel complete. Um, and I will also be sending a four page handout that's just really all about climate change. Some of the things we didn't get to touch on, um, so to give you sort of some, some resource, a distilled resource for you then, and lots of links to explore. So I, uh, I feel complete for today and I want to uh, give Terry the, the mic for the last word. And we can also have a little after party for anyone who wants to stay, but we're, we'll do our official closing after Terry speaks. In this moment, you know, I think I'm most touched by the raw and sometimes really beautiful qualities of feeling that I'm seeing expressed in chat messages and from those of you who've come on to make comments. We're going into a territory that's completely disorganizing and confusing. There's no way to do it right. And yet we can hide, we can put on a false front, we can do all kinds of things that falsify the moment. Here we are, we're eating up our plant, host planet where we are, you know, we've met the enemy and he is us. There's this potential grief and confusion and anger and, and we're in that so tenderly. We are in this, we are here together, in this, so, so tenderly. So feeling us, not just tenderly feeling, but bringing all we have, all our intelligence, all our 
care, all our generosity, our, all our force of will and creativity to bear. Let us befriend every living being that needs a friend. Help me, you who are the motive force of this universe, to be a better, more effective, more valuable friend to everything and everyone. Let us find our way from this gathering, this tender, tender gathering, heartened, less alone, with more sense of possibility and resources not blaming ourselves for not having all the right answers, not blaming everybody else for being so much a part of the problem, but discovering a sense of possibility. May it be so. Thank you, Brother Terry. Yeah. Climate change <clears throat> is spiritual practice. Blessings to your practice and to all of our practices. So I'll stop the recording. And if you'd like to stay for a little after party, you're most welcome. Bye-bye.